Okay. Um, a very good evening to everybody and a good morning to people who are joining us from elsewhere in the world. Um, we are very happy to begin um, with the first webinar in our series on sexism in the online publics. I'm Bhavna, a senior research associate at IT4 Change. I just want to um, start with sharing with you the house rules. Uh, Sneha, if you will uh, please take us to that panel. Um, the session will last 90 minutes. Each panelist will offer a 10 minute intervention followed by a discussion and question and answer. Um, we will alert all speakers one minute before their time ends. We request uh, all the panelists, except the speaker, to keep their mics off during the presentations. Uh, for safety purposes, participant audios and videos will be disabled throughout the session. Um, Participants will be able to interact with everyone throughout the, through the chat box and ask questions in the Q&A section. Hate speech of any kind will not be tolerated through the, through during, the section, during the session, so participants that are making such comments will immediately be removed from the session. Um, the discussion will be recorded and posted on it for changes YouTube channel. We will be live tweeting this session. Um, please fe feel free to tweet or retweet and tag us. Speakers and panelists are requested to keep their audio, audio keep their videos on and audios off unless they are speaking, uh, so we can have a more engaged uh, interaction today. Thank you, Anita. Please begin. Welcome, everybody. Uh, a brief introduction to the webinar series and a small context setting. Our audience for today perhaps does not need convincing about the widespread contempt for women especially women who speak their mind in online spaces. Contempt is the emotion, the driving force that keeps the gender digital fault lines alive and kicking. Trolls seem to believe that women are not people. And in the case of women from marginal or minority social groups who have historically borne the structural violence of social prejudice, the contempt seems to cascade into militant disgust and intolerance to their very being, let alone their right to have a voice. Sexism and misogyny are ancient and this truism is not a fun fact. As we keep up the good fight to hold the line for free speech and expression, cherishing the gift of online spaces and fiercely defending it, we need to pay heed to the systemic and rapid loss of narrative power that women as a class face in digital society. The unique contours of the digital physical hybrid world we inhabit amplify hate, recreate truth, and reshape public behavior, entrenching the power of those who already wield it. So what we are up against is not just the historical tenacity of gender-based violence, but a disruptive discontinuity, a problem of the magnitude of a global emergency. This is the delegitimization of women's right to be full citizens, to be present in public, to participate in public life as equal persons, a right that was always tenuous for all women and extremely so for some. Free speech is not free unless it's for all. The hate women face online is therefore both a liberalist nightmare and a Republican antithesis. And it needs to be addressed with great seriousness, deep deliberation and careful renegotiation. For a few years now, we at IT for Change have been working to develop a normative framework for the law to tackle online misogyny, to generate feminist taxonomies of sexist hate speech online, develop recommendations for legal and policy level action and take social media governance by the horns. As feminists, we see law very much as a site for social power, a site that we must engage with in various ways as may be appropriate in the temporal social context. Today's webinar is part of this longer process, the first in a series of three on sexism in the online publics. The webinar series is being held with support from IDRC Canada and Edel Give Foundation, titled, When Does Free Speech Become Censorship? The Constitutional Case Against Sexist Speech. Today's session will focus on how the constitutional limits to free speech 
need to be asserted in a rapidly digitalizing society, not only to ensure women's freedom from violence, but also to guarantee their full participation in public political life. Over the month and, the, and in the lead up to the International Women's Day, we are also pleased to bring you a compilation of authoritative essays written by legal scholars, practitioners, and activists, some of whom will participate in our webinar series. You can find the papers on the IT for Change website, and the link to this will also be posted on the chat today. Let me now turn to the pleasant duty of introducing our speakers today. We will have opening remarks from Nagma Mullah and Rohia Seward. Nagma is the President and Chief Operating Officer at Edelgiv Foundation and is deeply committed to the domains of education and women's empowerment. Ruhia is a Senior Program Officer at Canada's International Devel Development Research Centre and oversees a diverse portfolio of research on digital governance and feminist issues online all over the Global South. Our panel today features leaders who have applied themselves in different ways to human rights and social justice. Divya Srinivasan, our moderator for the evening, is a human rights lawyer working as South Asia consultant with Equality Now. Her work focuses on issues relating to gender, digital rights, and free speech. Asha Kautal, our first speaker, is an activist and development professional with over 15 years of experience in human rights work. She's the former general secretary of the All India Dalit Mahila Adhikar Manch. Amber Sinha, our third speaker, is a lawyer practicing in the Supreme sorry, as a second speaker is the executive director of the Center for Internet and Society and is well known for his work on privacy, digital identity, artificial intelligence, and misinformation. Aparna Bhatt, our third speaker, is a lawyer practicing in the Supreme Court of India for nearly three decades, and her work has had a far-reaching influence on government policies as also those of social media companies. Finally, we have with us Mariana Valente from Brazil, with whom we've collaborated for several years. Mariana is currently the director of Internet Lab, a law and technology research association, and a professor at Inspire University, Sao Paulo, Brazil. I now welcome Nagma to kick off the series. Over to you, Nagma. Thank you so much, Anita. And I would like to first uh, place my deep gratitude to being invited to open uh, this series. Uh, which is on a topic I was just sharing with Anita earlier that, that is so relevant, so on point, and so now uh, that, that I feel we are, we are actually racing against time to address something that is a, a part of our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so more power to you, and, I, and I, I love the way the series is structured, and I hope everyone who's uh, you know, joined us today will be joining us uh, in the, in the, in the, you know, uh, for the sessions as well. And with that, uh, I want to just briefly speak, not make it too long, but address all of you, not just as representative of Edelke Foundation, but also as a woman who is fairly, uh, you know, uh, I think getting, just getting comfortable with the online space. Um, uh, many years ago, I'd read this book called Sands of Time with, by Sydney Sheldon, but there's a nugget of information or wisdom there that I've not uh, forgotten, which is, you know, whether one is a rebel a traitor or a, or a, a patriot depends on who is in power at the time. And that, that logic applies to so many places, like whether something is misogyny or a hate speech or, a, you know, defending one's, uh, one's idol or a hate speech again is all subjective and objective, depending on who we are talking about who we think we are defending and what we think we're defending. So the lines are so blurred. This space is so uh, new and we are so eager to place our points of views that the rules of good and bad behavior have uh, been left far behind. Uh, add to it the entire issue of, you know, in-person misogyny that women face and have been facing for centuries now. Uh, it is not such a surprise that when the online space opened, we saw the worst behaviors uh, by people who now also had the benefit of anonymity uh, show their worst sides to pull every behavior that they did not, uh, you know, they did not like or they did not, it didn't confirm to their views. Given this, misogyny on online platforms is further going to prevent women from seizing opportunities for any kind of public uh, participation. Every time a political leader or a woman in, in even a limited uh, power is trolled, pulled down, criticized 
for her anything from her views to the way she dresses to the way she appears uh, it it uh, re, uh, it basically dejects it it uh, diverts attention from a point of view one but it also detracts so many other women from even placing basic points of view out there and that's why we see the same the same universe that we've seen in in person we are seeing a very aggravated version on point and given covid-19 i see this everywhere again uh, the provisions of the information technology act and the indian penal code they do not provide enough protection they do not provide enough recourse to women who are anyways uh, being bullied and are anyways very very careful about you know where they even voice their opinions and where they even voice their disgust or they are uh, you know where they want to place any negative comment on what they are hearing so enduring misogyny online has become a new normal for many women and the easy way is to stop uh, being a part of the online discourse which is probably the worst thing to happen because uh, the future is a lot of in a lot of ways online and we need women to participate more this issue is extremely critical and the uh, the, the policies that will be made Uh, I'm so glad that IT for Change has been working on this issue for a while now. But there is an additional responsibility that I'd like to call out here before signing off, which is while we're working with government, while we're navigating policies, ensuring that uh, you know there is some kind of structure for good and bad behavior, for control of bad behavior, we also need the public to understand uh, you know what's going on at least in a reasonable way. in the awareness of what uh, what are the larger structures that control uh, these things what is the recourse for a woman even if there is basic recourse uh, is absolutely not there there is no awareness of what a woman can do or cannot do to navigate tricky situations and i hope that as we move on and as we negotiate and and work on you know better policies and better safety and security for women against the misogyny online uh, we are also able to address the the blind spots for many many women who are navigating really in the blind uh, so with that i uh, again once again want to congratulate you on a very thoughtful uh, series of uh, a webinar series and uh, good luck to this discussion uh, thank you very much Thank you, Nagma. I now invite Ruhia uh, to please uh, make some opening remarks. Hi, thanks, Anita. Um, listen, I'm really honored to help open this conversation today and this and this webinar series on this really complex topic. I can't say anything more intelligent than Nagma and Anita already said. So. I'm going to just talk about IDRC and what we've been doing um in addition to supporting this work with IT for Change and Internet Lab. Um but it, well I should say too the International Development Research Center is part of Canada's international aid envelope and we support research across the global south. On this issue we really are aiming to unpack the issues in a nuanced way that we hope will be helpful in the long run for policy makers and tech platforms at, at the national and international level. Um one of the things we're doing actually is supporting the first uh broad-based statistically significant survey that's trying to assess the extent of online or gender-based um online or tech facilitated gender-based violence across 18 countries. That work is being led with the Center for Center for International Governance and Innovation CG it's called. with ipsos and actually we're just launching the survey excuse me this month uh we're also supporting research on how to foster a more feminist internet with the women's rights program at apc and this network of researchers is looking to unpack the challenges of a feminist internet and how we bring that about from access to infrastructure to gender based violence online and one of the partners there policy from uganda did a survey of urban environments in five countries across um Africa and actually it's gotten a lot of attention for highlighting as Nagma said the issues that we have um we're also looking at feminist artificial intelligence because we see that AI as a set of tools could maybe someday help us tackle tech facilitated violence but it really depends on how much we're able to unpack and confront the biases that are currently baked into these technologies so that's another piece of idrc's research 
But I think really the kind of information disorder that's propagated by sexist hate speech online is actually one of the more critical issues that we need to tackle in our digital public sphere. And we know actually that we don't have the answers, at least not yet. And what we think is important at IDRC and with grantees all over is to share knowledge and to discuss and interrogate ideas and to look for examples of, of what, what's happening and to listen to researchers like IT for Change and Internet Lab who are actually trying to grapple with these issues and help us come up with some answers. So I'm looking forward to our discussion today and thank you for inviting me. Thanks so much for that. Over to you, Divya, and all the experts uh, for today. Thank you so much, Anita. And uh, thanks very much, Anita, Nagma, and Ruya for your uh, insightful opening remarks. You've actually made my job as a moderator really easy by setting the context on, uh, you know, sexist hate speech online, which we're going to be discussing today. Um, and like Nagma mentioned, I think this is a very timely and much needed discussion, uh, given the extent to which sexist hate speech online is increasing every day across all social platforms. Um, I think maybe the most recent example, like could point to is really the shocking response to Rahana's tweet on the farmers protests in India, uh, which was uh, really faced with like a coordinated troll attack, um, which was filled with misogyny, racism, um, and even went to the extent of glorifying domestic violence. Um, and I think that sort of exemplifies the scale and depth of the problem in terms of sexist hate speech online that we're facing today. Uh, so we have a stellar lineup of speakers. I don't want to take too much time. I think just in order to frame the discussion, um, I think uh, as we're uh, uh, as part of our conversation today, uh, there are really three main issues uh, that we're going to be focusing on and hopefully doing a deep dive into. Uh, the first one is to sort of uh, explore um, the impact of misogynistic and hate speech online on women and how it's had a chilling effect on their participation in digital spaces uh, using an intersectional and feminist perspective. Um, the second uh, is one thing which I think uh, we often miss out on is connecting the online to the offline. Uh, that is to really explore how hate speech online connects to and it's grounded in gender-based violence and patriarchy on the ground and how in turn um, these uh, hierarchies of power, whether based on gender, caste, or uh, any other hierarchies, um, are sort of uh, uh, maintained in an online space um, and facilitated, and how uh, sexist hate speech plays a role in maintaining that hierarchy um, and facilitating it. Um, and the third issue, which I think we're going to be spending a lot of time on, because this sort of really requires a nuanced discussion, is how do we regulate uh, sexist hate speech uh, online in order to uphold free speech for everybody while at the same time uh, being responsive to feminist concerns and ensuring that digital spaces are safe and equally accessible for women. Um, so uh, those are just the, the, the framing of the discussion that I wanted to set out. Uh, before I move on to our speakers, I just wanted to uh, remind the audience, um, we're going to be taking questions at the end, uh, but while the speakers are speaking, please feel free to drop in your questions in the chat box or the comment section. We'll be keep keeping a track of it throughout the discussion and then we'll address them all together uh, once the panelists have made their interventions. Um, so I'd like to invite our first speaker, um, Asha. Um, Asha, could you tell us a little bit about your experience with organizing Dalit Women Fight, um, the, the challenges that you've Face and particularly what has been the impact of sexist hate speech that you've faced online um, in terms of Dalit women's ability to participate in these public debates, both online and offline? And also, how have you responded to these challenges? Wow. Hi, everyone. And um, thank you, Divya, and everyone else uh, joined in for this uh, discussion this evening. Um, yeah, I should start. I have 10 minutes only. Madiga whore, Chamarin prostitute. Are these sexist slurs? Are these caste slurs? So I think beginning a discussion on sexism in online publics by centering the voices of the most marginalized women is not just essential 
but in my opinion the most relevant and the most useful one uh, in analyzing uh, what we are going to discuss today and also the further policy related work from the outcomes of this webinar that is actually um, proposed i believe that this is an all encompassing method which begins and starts from the most oppressed women and hence that's why it ensures that everybody else is also meaningfully represented i think that delving right into the core of intersections and moving outwards in this web takes care of that and it includes all the other diverse voices uh, in a very just and uh, ethical uh, manner often times i in my experience it's done the other way around and then that's what happens is at the end the marginalized voices we are somewhere way down in the list so that's why we are at the risk of never being heard or at the most being a kind of a patch or an add on to the larger discussion usually so that's why i want to actually begin by saying um thanks and i'm really grateful that uh, the organizers chose to uh, start off this discussion from this framework and uh, so that you know we are ensuring that all voices are included and heard and making sure that they are based uh, fit, placed right at the uh, center at the opening of this uh, webinar series so really my gratitude to you all sexism and online publics i think i'll add offline online any other line also and i really believe that without an intersectional approach it serves really no purpose we will dismantle patriarchy we will analyze misogyny we will understand sexism and online publics and then we'll all go home thinking that we've done our job for today but actually without unraveling the other layers of oppression we really not done our job and in fact i think we would be doing the opposite like we would actually be doing injustice to the plan that we are all uh, launching ourselves this evening and in that sense uh, actually absolutely uh, missing the bus caste discrimination uh untouchability violence against dalit women and girls uh, actually often begins with verbal assaults uh this reminds me of a study more than 10 yeah 10 12 years ago dalit women speak out um uh which documented more than 100 cases of violence against dalit women and the the main repeatedly women kept saying about how verbal assaults and how uh, caste slurs uh caste laced gender uh, gendered abuses actually killed us from uh, inside like you know hitting us slapping us with a chappal something would have been different but actually hitting us right deep inside and killing us from within start start starts always with verbal assaults i think this is the abuse of democratic right to freedom of speech which begins at the schools it begins at the water taps it begins at the panchayat office it begins in our colleges our universities it ends up into our uh, romantic and love um, encounters as well in our lives and this pattern something which seamlessly enters the digital uh, spaces also this is what uh, we have experienced then i also wanted to say that these verbal assaults uh, and physical assaults as well are predominantly public in in uh, nature the primary intention of that is actually to silence to really threaten and silence and and put a cap on those voices of assertion and i think that whether it's a sphere of education uh, getting a job economic social mobility getting into political participation any of those and i think quelling that assertion happens by uh, silencing and that happened up to us all our lives and now it the same thing seamlessly has flowed into these online digital spaces that we have finally come in, uh, come into i think so we should also not forget that the perpetrators of this kind of violence both online and offline for us have been uh, men uh, men from our own communities Uh, men from other dominant caste communities as well as women from dominant caste communities and therefore i believe it is very very critical to always use this lens to understand all the different power equations that are at play at the same point in time without which as i said earlier we would really be doing injustice to the task that we are uh, headed towards so therefore i think that the the physical public space like the water tap or the school same thing happens in this online public spaces and that's how this entire vicious cycle just is getting uh, continued 
Casti's slurs, um, uh, hate, and like that poison, that venom actually on Dalit women in online spaces, I think is so um, painful. Uh, and I think it's something the most, it has, it has proved to be one of the most difficult uh, experiences uh, for us. And it actually takes me back, Divya, to what you started off with, like to what our experience has been at Dalit Women Fight. I think uh, with my experiences at the beginnings of Dalit Women Fight a couple of years ago, that perhaps being the first organized effort of Dalit Women online and these digital spaces, I remember at that time, Facebook, kya hai, Twitter, kya hai, what is a hashtag, how do we do? So we were actually just grappling with that and something so exciting was uh, happening to us. And as women who have been historically deprived of resources, access to technology, uh, uh, mobile phone, 4G, uh, whatever, all these uh, tech, tech, tech uh, aspects. And we had the basic um, issue of English language at that time to engage uh, uh, with this kind of online spaces. So tackling one after the other, it was a moment of freedom for us. Uh, uh, learning and, you know, finding and exploring because we always had this experience with mainstream media. Uh, so frustrating, uh, uh, always using us as um, victims, us and our bodies being portrayed as victims, always sen sensationalizing these cases of uh, violence against us. And it was so frustrating. So suddenly for us, we had this thing that this is our space. We can assert, we can write, we can speak, we can tell our stories, we can, we can go back to our history and we can actually recreate something for our uh, children and for other, others in our community. So we were so excited about this. So we, all of those training sessions, the basic tools we learned, and then we started doing all of that. We had like... We wanted to tell the stories of resilience. We want to tell the stories of how courageous our foremothers have been and how we are uh, taking on this battle for social justice. All of this was in our, uh, in our um, minds. But very, very, very early into this experience, we realized that we are totally not safe. Like we were so unsafe. And um, actually after using these digital spaces, we became so much more um, unsafe. And I think it was not just the the trolling or the, the kind of online um, harassment uh, that we faced, but that was bad. But of course, it's very quickly moved over to the offline spaces. We were being identified uh, where we were, what our uh, organizing work was going on, the on the ground movement building, campaigning work. And so we were, uh, we were being identified and being, um, you know, of course, uh, threatened and harassed. At the time, like we, continue to hold the vision of Dr. Baba Sahib Abedkar very close to our hearts, seeking the constitutional guarantees for ourselves and the survivors of violence that we were closely working with. So we knew that, you know, we had this uh, SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act, uh, everything uh, about the caste attachability, uh, unconstitutional by law. Little did we know that having this act and other legislations uh, would have would be of no use, and we didn't know what kind of repercussions it would have on us um, and our uh, families as well. We had to regroup, obviously, and then we had to study more about digital secu security, how to keep ourselves safe, how to keep our equipment safe, etc. How to manage or not manage these uh, uh, vicious attacks that were happening us uh, happening to us online. Slowly and steadily, we moved forward. We kept learning, but our experiences clearly show that, especially when we were fighting a particular case on the ground, our um, uh, the people who were attacking us were local groups from that district or from that place, uh, individuals and organized groups, including the from the perpetrator side and also other Dalit ma male activists in that region who used every possible strategy to silence us. That includes um, online threats, uh, false propaganda, of course, this whole character assassination targeting kind of thing. The, the uh, I'm sorry, really sorry to interrupt you. Uh, your time is up. Could you just yeah, start yeah, up? Finish, finish. So all Thank moving you. from offline threats, phone calls, WhatsApps, email, all this. So the pushback for us as women online is real. And for Dalit women, I think it's a double-edged uh, edged, uh, sword. 
finally, I want to finally say one last thing. When we came to the digital spaces, we came with the intention of telling our stories and visualizing the voices, uh, uh, vis visualizing the voices that were often pushed to the margins. The objective was to really build a solidarity, a critical mass for those who would really unpack privilege and take a risk and stand with us. Sadly, we are left with little to hope for. We are, many of us are exhausted, anxious, and in a state of predic predicament, after a grueling, traumatic day of holding survivors, fighting administration, dodging the cops, we come back to our digital accounts to face another round of horror. So really, we need to think about how we can revive our energies, how we can use this gift to actually um, be part of this fight uh, for justice, not just for Dalit women, but for all uh, women across the world. So JB Man, thank you. Thanks very much, Asha. Uh, so, I mean, just uh, building on what Asha said, I think what you pointed out was, um, you know, how social media can really be a space to assert like uh, independent opinions, particularly for women from marginalized communities. But at the, at the same time, uh, this is sort of uh, coupled with um, verbal assault and abuse, which which ha really has the intention to silence women. Um, so um, moving on to you, Amber, I think just building on uh, Asha's insights into this and the impact of uh, sexist speech and harassment online, uh, could you expand a bit on how such harassment acts as censorship and how and why uh, should such acts of sexist speech online be regulated? Thanks. I think the uh, logical point that I, I probably want to come in, uh, in terms of, I think where Asha left off was, I think to begin in any of these discussions, what we need to center is, is the idea of, of power and privilege and the role that they play uh, in terms of uh, values that govern communication. And the, the, the specific question that we are facing here is when we are looking at uh, at online harassment specifically and its censorious impact. So the thing that we need to start off is that while the proliferation of the internet was expected to facilitate greater online participation of women and other marginalized groups, what we have seen essentially is that the, uh, the online space largely mirrors the same offline hierarchies. Like Asha was saying that this, the physical open spaces that we would see and the kind of, of problems of discrimination, uh, of exclusion, of harassment that we that one would uh, encounter there, they are largely reflected in the online space as well. And I wanted to begin with with a specific observation uh, and, and sort of that I've tried to build upon. Uh, in her book Twitter and Tear Gas: The Power and Fragility of Network Protest, Zeynep Tufiki talks about uh, the the nature and impact of censorship on social media and how it's different. Uh, to begin with, when we thought of censorship, that was that worked by restricting speech, right? But now censorship also works in the form of organized harassment campaigns. And, and there the, the qualities of a viral outrage are used to impose a disproportionate cost on the very act of speaking out. Uh, and the, 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 I think the demographics, the communities which, are, uh, which bear the heaviest cost of this are women and the LGBTQ community. So in that sense, the, uh, I think when we think of censorship, traditionally what it involved was the participation of some kind of a gatekeeping actor who would control the dissemination of information right now. So whether it is in the form of judicial or, or an executive order or in, in terms of its own editorial policies or, or other sort of societal values that it was trying to exhibit would prohibit the dissemination of what it perceived as offending content. Uh, but the censorship that we see in the digital age is not dichotomous in the same way. Now, unlike the pre-digital era where gatekeepers would decide whether to censor content, censorship now also operates in a way as, as a denial of, of access or attention through, through multiple kinds of means. So there, I think, you know, when you have uh, you know, deliberate sowing of confusion, fear, uh, creating artificial doubt by aggressively questioning the credibility of speakers, creating or claiming hoaxes, generating harassment campaigns designed to make it harder for credible conduits 
these are these are sort of uh, standard kind of strategies that we see being employed online day in day out uh, with a very clear focus to silence the voices of certain demographics and and those by and large those demographics are those of uh, which which are already the most disadvantaged and that is the aspect of digital censorship that uh, uh, that we want to focus on here is the generation of harassment campaigns designed to either silence or in other ways to delegitimize the, the very source of the information and uh, or groups and particularly those groups being that of women and uh, and lgbtq plus communities now the uh, and then there are you know those techniques would also be more direct in terms of continual comments replies direct messages and then uh, we also see offline sort of manifestations of uh, where you know they, they turn into doxing they turn into phone calls they, they turn into more extreme setting up fake profiles with the let's uh, and by and large what we have seen that when we have looked at uh, at, at problems of problematic speech the most common response to that that we've spoken about has been counter speech uh, you know counter speech has uh, uh, has been the most standard response and the way we think of counter speech is 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 also uh, you know something that we've thought of for the past 100 years that it appears in varying form but the most commonly referenced form is that counter speech is at the end of the day a tool of persuasion and you know in its online form the way one we normally imagine it is counter speech would be witnessed as one user addressing another in an attempt to change their opinion belief or behavior now the efficacy of counter speech particularly in in the online context remains extremely debatable and in any case any kind of counter speech depends on factors such as the size of a group the Uh, you know the, the the particular act that is being addressed by counter speech the form of content the tone of the message all of these contextual factors play a large role uh in in how efficient counter speech would be but the the thing that that we forget when we talk about counter speech is we again ignore the questions of power and privilege it is uh it what counter speech does is it gives value to the power of speech and it is this belief that gives preference to counter speech over censorship except in very limited circumstances which are like incitement to violence or others but the fact that it is limited in its power and reach is something that should be palpable to us those who are already the most marginalized the most disadvantaged and the most abused often suffer the most at the hands of problematic and dangerous speech and also then have the least amount of agency to respond through counter speech and what it does in in some ways is also it it ignores the uh the very sort of real harms uh of dangerous speech it somehow assumes that counter speech would lead to a kind of equilibrium which suggests that you have increased positive speech on one side that will cancel out the harms of counter speech and that view in a way uh is 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 extremely problematic because it completely ignores the very very real life harms uh, that dangerous or problematic speech has uh, and <coughs> and this argument also assumes some kind of equity in opportunity equity in capacity for speech between the abuser and the abused the harasser and the harassed which i think is is a is a, is a very problematic frame to even begin thinking about so the and so i think the obvious kind of things about the chilling effect and the censorious effect that we see from online harassment and other forms of uh, of abuse uh, that both women and the lgbt community face online uh, it is important to start thinking of its impact rather than just thinking of the intent or whether it fills within the the sort of very uh, we ignoring of what hate speech is and that is the only kind of thing that we govern now in general when we think of categories of speech which are seen outside of protected speech there are threats there is hate speech there is incitement to violence these are the things that laws in in in, in most countries uh, do regulate but most of the problematic behavior doesn't 
meet this this very sort of strict thresh, legal threshold that that these categories of speech has and that's where we are seeing uh, a kind of regulatory problem that we are facing in terms of how we respond to that and that response both from from a platform point of view as well as from the state point of view as well as as collectives how should we respond to them i think in all of all the different stakeholders who can potentially respond to this are at a loss in terms of 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 speech which clearly falls below uh the standard so the i think there are two core questions that we must look at uh, or we must try to resolve to make progress this line of thinking the first is within the broad category of speech to harassment to dangerous speech what kind of uh, speech acts are, are censorious speech acts and the second is when one does reach a conclusion that a certain act is censorious or or has a clear chilling effect then what kind of regulate to response is truly legitimate now i think the first key factor like i mentioned earlier to keep in mind here is that of context the scope of protected free speech depends on the context and when we evaluate different thresholds of free speech protections we have to keep into account certain factors so even traditionally for instance certain kinds of speech so speech in schools and workplaces has been subject to a very different kind of standard uh, as opposed to speech in public spaces right more granularly when we look at uh, speech makers in school then we we think of various kinds of factors are they minors or majors are they younger or older minors is the speech part of their political speech so already what we see are examples of power uh which which uh, manifests themselves in very clear ways in let's say setting such as school and workplace they are seen as as key determinants of, on how we must uh, we can further regulate speech then the second key factor that we have to look at is the degree of disruption uh this online harassment causes to you so if you have constant abuse which is designed to create substantial disruption and uh that may move beyond the scope of what we can consider protected speech even if it does not fall very clearly under you know what we might understand as incitement or or hate speech so the 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 framework that uh, that i i'm very sorry to interrupt you your wrap up please <laughs> so 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 I'll, i'll i'll very briefly talk about the framework that i refer here that is that uh, this is a framework that is developed by the dangerous speech project which is led by susan danish and the the framework is that of dangerous speech as opposed to hate speech which is any form of expression that can increase the risk that its audience will condone or uh, or commit violence against members of another group so here the the instead of a vague standard like hate speech this is a more specific standard where we are looking at speech from this clear lens of the impact that it has on the audience as opposed to the very clear intent of spreading hate that hate speech would have and there i think some of the uh the key determinants that we look at are promotion of fear resorting to untruths causing direct harm causing indirect harm such as motivating others to think and act against members of the group in question uh and obviously the primary discomfort here comes from the idea of over criminalization of speech which is where uh i try to argue that the dangerous speech concept is is actually a more minimal one and also it it strikes more clearly at the heart of the problem which is the clear impact that 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 form of speech has and uh, i think the other kind of thing is to also be kind of reflexive in our regulatory strategy when we look at it so in terms of what platforms can do to uh, enable greater uh, uh, transparency to allow users to to, to actually uh, you know rather than it being a black box to actually be more clear about their own uh, community guidelines and the strategies for removal and Uh, i think great better access to the dressel mechanism which is what is missing very very solely right now uh that's needed so i think uh, since my time is up i'll pause there and maybe later there are a couple of points that i can come back to yeah sure thanks, we'll thanks definitely so try and come back to you later so i mean thanks very much amber for i guess really pointing out why counter speech is not always a viable alternative and also laying out like the potential regulatory models we can have um for the sexist speech to fall within unprotected constitutional categories um so i think uh, just building on that um aparna could you um, expand on what remedies that which are already available under indian law in such cases and also which amber touched upon really 
briefly at the end, um, like what is really the role and responsibility of platforms and intermediaries in such cases? And what are your recommendations in terms of things that need to change for us to better address text to speech online? Um, uh, thank you, Divya. That was uh, kind of the question actually kind of takes a kind of us and continues the dialogue which uh, Asha and Amber have so articulately uh, put across to all of us. Of course, I have to do the customary thank you to IT for Change for um, inviting me to uh, be part of this uh, panel. I'm really um, flattered to be, to be included. Um, since um, the um, time is short, let me come to the point directly to answer the question that uh, Divya has asked me. Uh, I would like to answer it this way. Um, to be able to uh, have an avenue, to be able to uh, apply the law, first of all, we have to have an understanding of what we think is misogyny. Uh, and the law has to understand this. Unfortunately, as we know, the law hasn't really understood it in a way that we would like and or we appreciate and also understands women's issues. So coming from this kind of a, a setup that the law has been, it has been a really uphill task for practitioners, uh, for most practitioners and also uh, activists on the ground uh, to make sure that misogyny is addressed in a way that we would like to address. Uh, so um, um, if you look at the uh, penal code, for, for example, if you look at prosecution, if you look at the penal code, the penal code came into this whole sector of understanding misogyny much late, you know, pretty late. So we had a kind, we had a kind, of, a, a kind of a tangential intervention in the beginning. Uh, where they uh, talked about uh, where they talked about obscenity, where they talked about addressing uh, uh, gest uh, gestures, addressing violence against women, you know, it, it kind of those trajectories. And we were we basically had some kind of a, a notion on the criminal intimidation, where we could perhaps expand and then get into this uh, aspect of bringing a criminal case against the uh, 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 alleged perpetrator. That that is that is that is the biggest challenge that we that we that we have right now. Even when the IT Act came, uh, when, uh, when the IT Act came, and then when you look at the history of the IT Act, the IT Act was only essentially brought in, uh, and by IT Act, I mean Information Technology Act. It was essentially brought in to make sure that the financial transactions are kind of a sanctified. So there's, that it was the whole thrust of the act was financial. It looked at what the internet can do to women and to children and to other kinds of abuse. And then as, we, uh, as Asha rightly pointed out, uh, in every section of the society, there are some people who are more marginalized than the rest. So if you look at, if you look at uh, people in general, you'll, you'll find women and children are more marginalized. Amongst them, if you look at Dalit women, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're more marginalized. So then the, the, and the, the challenges for them to address uh, any kind of, a, a seek any kind of redressal is more, you know, it's, it's more acute. So these, are, these, are the, these, these things happen in every sector and including uh, uh, addressing online, addressing any kind of abuse online. So given these challenges, uh, the question that arises now is that how did the IT Act, you know, the singular act is related to technology, uh, how does that come to, uh, come to our support? And it did, uh, in my uh, understanding of how it is, it did try to make some kind of an effort. Unfortunately, it was the whole spectrum was so broad. It was abused and not by women. It was, it was not abused by women. It was, it was abused by others who were in people in power. And because of which the section that we had, which could have actually been a tool for us uh, to use against misogyny was taken out because it, it, there was a widespread abuse of this expression. Now coming to the, uh, the dialogue and the dichotomy or the, um, how to say, conflict between freedom of speech and expression and of course bringing in uh, and curtailing this kind of a free speech of misogyny that one is being used. And that's a, that, that's a balance that I'm not sure most of us have achieved. What, what we constantly see is that when we engage with any kind of uh, um, uh, remedial uh, measures that we want to uh, that we want to you know that we want to introduce or that, or that we want to uh, pursue, we are constantly thrown this challenge that no, you're curtailing my free speech. That, that's the first challenge. And if you were to talk to the intermediary about it, the intermediary always says, and in fact, some of them have said to me in my dialogue with them that imagine what this censorship can do to um, activism. Uh, advocacy and all other kinds of things. And this is the argument which they always, which, which they always bring about. Now, my question, my answer to uh, all of these has been that, you know, free speech is not absolute in no jurisdiction. With free speech comes a responsibility and accountability. So while I have <clears throat> my right to freedom of speech and expression, I do not have a right to abuse you. And, and that's the threshold that we, we need to be consciously aware of. Of course, as Amber was pointing out, the uh, where is where do you draw the line? What is abuse and what is not abuse? Where do you draw the line? 
is very subjective. And I think here we must respect the wisdom of the woman complaining to say that if she feels abused, if she feels belittled, if she feels that she's been subject to any kind of uh, sexist or any kind of misogyny, we need to respect that and accept it there and then and then investigate further. And that 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 I, I would think that would be the, that would be the threshold if a woman complains herself. But we are all we also have instances where there's some kind of mass complaint. For example, I'll give you um, I mean, uh, this very popular example in that sense. A very a popular Bollywood film star a, a couple of years back made a comment on rape in a, in a very casual way. So everyone, the entire social media, everyone, uh, you know, pounced on him and he was asked to apologize and he didn't apologize. All kind of back and forth, you know, with this this happened a couple of years back. Now in these situations, what you do? It's again because here the argument was that it's perception. It was casually used, but there again, one needs to draw lines and have some kind of protocols to say that yes, you can use these words, but there is. It's a sense of responsibility when you make it in a public space. So now while I, while I can discuss sexual assault in a private space in a, in a particular way, you know, when you make it in a public space, when you put it out there for everyone to hear, there is a responsibility and you have to be careful about how to use that. Now coming to the online aspect of the whole, the whole thing, as we all know, uh, you know, we talked about anonymity, the way this is cheap, it's free, most, and you can access it anywhere that you want and, it is, and you, you can never be tracked down. There are all these... Uh, aspects that in the internet offers, which actually gives a lot of courage for people to uh, have some kind of an extremely seamless and uh, unbridled kind, kind of a way in which they can express themselves in on the, on, online. And that is what is causing us a lot of distress. A lot of women are subject to a lot of, uh, you know, a, mis a lot of, lot of uh, abuses, some bordering on intimidation, some actually, uh, actually coming on to, come, come, becoming threats. How do you deal with it? Now, I want to focus on law enforcement and intermedi intermediaries in the, I think, and I have about three, four minutes, and I'll see if, we can, if I can manage to do it in the next three, four minutes. You see, law enforcement, unfortunately, is extremely intimidating. And not just for me. I mean, I'm a lawyer, and I should not be intimidated by the law or the law enforcement or the law police, but I'm intimidated to make a complaint to the police. And I can imagine how a young woman or an older woman or a woman who doesn't have resources, how intimidated he or she can be if they, if they have to deal with law enforcement. So the first thing that the law enforcement has to do is to make sure that the avenue that they provide is available in a way which is not intimidating, free, and easily accessible. And I think what better than the internet? So if the internet is a space for abuse, internet should also be the space where I should be able to access remedy. The law is attempted to do it, and I think cybercrime uh, portal, which is up there, it has its limitation, but it is a beginning. So one should be using it. It also provides us to make complaints anonymously, and I hope that in the chat box after I run, I, I will give, give that link so people people can um, uh, you know use that that use that space that, that that's the first thing. The second thing I want to say is that the spaces in which these abuses are hurled at us should be accountable. So if I own a house and in my house abuse is taking place, I can't say that I'm not responsible for it. I'm responsible for it. I didn't create the abuse. I did not initiate the abuse. I did not support the abuse. But I'm facilitating it by keeping quiet, giving the space. So in my opinion, the intermediaries who run these platforms of whatever kind, whether it's a search or it's a content host a provider, they have a responsibility to make sure that their space is safe and they have to constantly endeavor to make it safe. For them to use the argument that it is free speech, I think it's not acceptable. Yes, free speech is there, but it comes with responsibility. They also have to make sure that just the way they have revenue sharing and they have a data sharing for revenue, they have to make sure that they should also have some kind of agreements to share complaints that will actually help the complainant, the person complaining, to make it as quick, as the remedy as quick as fast as possible. So if I'm if I can send a if I can send a message in a few seconds, the my complaint about that message should also reach across platforms in a few seconds, and they have the technology to do it. And that is that is something that that is something they 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 need they, they need to do. And the, the whole challenge that, that, has been, uh, that, that has been is that on the one hand, we have this free speech advocate saying that no curtailment at all. On the other hand, we have women constantly sub subject to this kind of misogyny and people you know, uh, abusing us, uh, you know, people using the online, online platform to abuse women to, 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 to an extent that we can't even, we can't even imagine. Uh, so give, given this kind of a trajectory, I think what we should do, I'll just wind up in, in a moment, uh, because I've already got Divya's uh, prompt, which, I've, which I just saw. Uh, what, what, what I think we should do is that we will have to utilize the spaces available to us to complain as much as possible. 
complacency is not something that will help us today if i get an offensive video i need to take action i need to complain wherever possible and, you know, and then the problem that that is happening is that we are in a, in, a, in the, we are in a group of the people who are converted we know what we are talking about unfortunately out there people do not believe that there is so much misogyny online and if if you were to do a census today you'll understand that very few people understand what is misogyny even women subject to misogyny will do not have an understanding of it it's important for us to do an ad, very aggressive advocacy to tell people women children schools colleges everywhere that misogyny is not acceptable this is the forums available for complaint don't worry about the remedy don't worry about what the outcome is but complain the moment you are thrust with so many complaints that somebody people will wake up and come take action and this is something i'm and i'll, I'll wind up with an example that i i want to give here today whatsapp for example did not have a report button for a very long time if you be whatsapp users you will know that they never had a report button and it took us about one and a half years active nagging for a lack of a better word i'm using it in the, from the court from the law enforcement from us to tell them that finally for them to put up a report button on their flat in 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 their in in their app it took us that kind of advocacy for them even after the court passed an order for them it took us a long time to make sure that actually implemented now i can tell you that globally it is up in any when it's not just in india across the globe wherever you use whatsapp there is a report button it's another thing altogether that we don't know what happens the report but at least the report button is there so i think uh, to conclude i want to say that as long as we tolerate misogyny the misogynists will continue to use this space and hurl abuses at us as they been doing to i hope uh, that we continue we will make sure that we try to curtail it in whatever way possible we support each other and complain as much as possible i'm not sure if i address all of divya's questions uh, but my passion sometimes takes over my uh, you know uh, uh, my intervention uh, and i who do hope that if i am able to address some of the concerns and questions uh, if if there is time and we come back thank you so much thank you so much for that uh, really uh, erudite explanation of i guess what in, in the position under indian law is and also for i guess for pointing out really the failure of the law to understand and address misogyny in the first place um, and the issue in terms of access to remedies and law enforcement um, so i think uh, this is a really good point uh, to bring in our final panelist mariana um, so you have heard like the first three speakers um, really i guess talking about the indian context um and we would love to uh, get your view on how sexist hate speech is addressed in the brazilian system um and what are the lacuna and the current legal approaches in brazil and how does it really compare to the way that we're dealing with it, with it in india thanks divya i'd like to start by thanking for the invitation i'm very flattered to be here too Uh, thanks, IT for Change, IDRC, and uh, at Internet Lab Brazil, we're developing this project together with uh, IT for Change on hate against women, and I think it's a really important opportunity to have all these things discussed. And I'm very inspired also by my fellow panelists, and I want to build on top of what they've been saying to speak a little bit more about like a broader context and the Brazilian context as. Divya has asked me to. Um, so I think one thing that's important to say is that this is worldwide, right? Uh, Aparna was mentioning that uh, misogyny is not recognized, and it's not recognized in the law. And this is exactly what I wanted to say uh, in this presentation: that this is something that we've been seeing worldwide. Of course, we can't speak for all countries, but in this project, we've been um, reading analysis uh of people doing research in different countries and this is something that everybody's pointing to so there is an issue uh there and this is particular what we've been seeing in india and in brazil so just a few words about the importance of the law in all this i think aparna uh, has uh made already a great point on this Uh, but I think it's important to highlight here that we know that the law, everybody of us, I guess, we all know that the law alone is not sufficient to result in a meaningful change of social attitudes, uh, especially because in the case of misogyny, we're speaking of attitudes that have been shaped and maintained for centuries. But it does have a significant role to play when we think of influence and change in such behaviors. Um, as well as providing meaningful avenues for redress for women 
uh, these women who have been subject, subjected to online misogyny, gender-based hate, and other forms of abuse. Um, but uh, worldwide, gender is generally not recognized as one of the basis for hate in hate legislations, including constitutional law and in constitutional discussions around free speech in courts. We know that the origins of anti-hate legislations is generally traced back to post-Second World War era, post-Holocaust, and in the context of decolonization as well. Uh, and most of these laws refer to race and ethnicity. And uh, when we look into international law as well, um, no, no, none of the conventions speak of gender-based hatred. There are, of course, um, conventions speaking of general prohibitions of discrimination, uh, but not gender-based hatred in particular. And there, I think it's important just to make uh, a small conceptual discussion. Uh, when we're speaking of misogyny, we're speaking of uh, hostility towards women because they're women. And there, of course, we have to bring in the discussions about different women and what it means to be uh, women who, who have different uh, races, ethnicities, sexualities, and all that. Uh, and when we're speaking of hate, uh, we're also speaking of, uh, we're speaking of a concept that can be legal and can not be legal. And usually the legal definitions are narrower than those from other uh, disciplines. Uh, and I think another important thing to highlight here is that uh, hate crimes is also different from hate speech, right? When we're speaking of hate crimes, we're speaking uh, uh, always of a crime that's accompanied by hate. And when we're speaking of hate speech in general, we're speaking of hate as an effect of speech. Uh, all that to say that there is a lot of focus on hate crimes worldwide. They, there is some focus on hate speech, but we don't see a focus on hate speech against women. And why is that? And one of the things that we've been discussing on this project is that there is this very clear phenomenon of normalization of this kind of speech. We see that in the public sphere, misogyny is so open and so often that it's even uttered by political leaders from President Trump in the United States to President Bolsonaro in Brazil to many other political leaders worldwide. And while that attracts some critique, there's a lack of significant consequences and that normalizes these attitudes, creates a general climate of legitimization. And the law worldwide has remained silent about these specific expressions and that pushes it into the gray, gray zone of non-regulation. Um, Gender-based violence, misogyny, prejudice against women, they have become normalized to the extent that they're seen as falling outside the scope of the legal regulation of hate crime and hate speech as well. And again, normalization is not just attri attributable to the problems in the legal system, nor will be, it will be solved by it, but the legal system is well placed to tackle uh, the issue. Then there is the issue that um, this is a problem that's built, of course, into the legal systems. And I think Aparna was referring to that and Amber was referring to that as well before. Uh, the law is gender biased everywhere in the world and feminist legal scholars from everywhere in the world have been building a body of evidence coming from legal concepts. So when we speak of Brazil, for example, until the beginning of the century, we had this concept of honest women in the criminal code that was still used. Uh, as an important con uh, concept uh, to many of the, the crimes uh, that were predicted there. Uh, but we're also speaking uh, of interpretation and enforcement and double standards that judges use when judging, for example, sexual crime, right? Um, and this is something that I wanted to build upon a little bit. We've been doing case law research in Brazil, IT for Change is doing it in India, and also based on other pieces of research, research from other places, we know how hard it is get, how hard it is to get um, any discrimination recognized by judges. Uh, in most cases, hate is dismissed by courts in favor of a narrative that there was no real intent. And I think that dialogue enters into a dialogue with my previous panelists as well. And even more, 
uh, in the case of misogyny, and even more if we're speaking of women of color, lesbian or trans women. It is as if misogyny is an everyday issue. So it's not even recognized. And I think that's an important thing to say because this problem is often framed in terms of a conflict between free speech and misogyny or free speech and hate speech against women. But what we see when we look at the enforcement of the law is that this conversation doesn't even develop. We don't even see the recognition uh, of uh, discrimination and hate against women as a problem that's recognized by courts. So it doesn't reach this level of the discussion uh, of a uh, balance uh, between uh, these values, uh, let's say. And that's because it's very connected um, to social conceptions, right? Um, we do have a hypothesis. One of our hypotheses for this normalization is that um, hate against women and misogyny more generally um, has a lot to do with the biologization of bodies. Uh, this is something that anthropologists have been writing about, feminist anthropologists have been writing about for some time, um, how uh, discrimination against women is so biolo biologiz biologized, I'm sorry, uh, that dismantling this discourse of nature is quite a challenge, and this leads to normalization. Um, and we're seeing that the unwillingness to deal with this misogynistic attitude contributes to view these incidents of online violence as, let's say, only bullying or something that's mostly related to domestic violence, while what we see is that this is a much broader issue. So I'll stop there. I'd just like to say that uh, when we look at all these, all these aspects and uh, also building on what um, my colleagues have said uh, previously, um, I think it's very important that we think of legal reform. Uh, and I know that this series of uh, events is speaking of this, but we have to think of including gender in lists of protected characteristics under hate crime legislations all around. And we have to reform legislations to ref uh, address offenses committed on or using social media. And uh, there I'd also like to agree on my fellow panelists and what they were saying about how these events develop differently on social media and we need a new framework. So that's it for now. I'm open to all questions and to dialogue. Thank you so much, Mariana. Just a reminder to everybody, uh, we're gonna start the question answer session now. So if you have any questions, please uh, drop them in the chat box. Um, I think uh, there's actually one question which sort of really relates to what, where you just left off, Mariana, in terms of the legal reform necessary. Um, you mentioned how a lot of laws don't have gender as one of the protected categories, uh, but are there any examples of best practices or you know of laws in any country that actually do already cater to this? or uh, you know, at least get us uh, somewhere along the line uh, to a, to a bet better method of addressing sexist speech online. Is this for me or for all participants? I'm I mean, sorry. for all participants. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I'll you... let them speak. Uh, but yeah, Mariana, if you have, I mean, you can go first if you want. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I don't think we've seen um, legislation that um, adequately addresses these issues, but we've seen other kinds of legislation relating to women and women's rights that go uh, in good directions. Uh, so, for example, uh, even in Brazil, uh, we have a domestic violence law that was built after the struggle of feminist movements for two decades and um, that really focuses on the effects on women 
and not on individualizing uh, the issue uh, in forms of uh, um, in terms of criminal law, for example. Uh, although we can't give up on criminal law, uh, that's uh, also recognized as very important. Um, it's a law that tries to build an institutional protection for women who are going through domestic violence um, in terms of institutions of support and also of protective measures. And I think that's very important to think of when we're thinking of social media. Um, so I think that's one example of a way to go, of changing the approach of not just looking into this individualizing of one's intent and trying to understand what the effects are and how you address all of them. Right. Thank you. Um, also, I think there was a specific uh, question for Aparna, so I think I'll go to you next. Um, uh, one of the audience members has said, uh, referred to what you had said in your remarks in terms of free speech with responsibilities, uh, but really questioning um, whether this should apply only to misogyny or uh, if I'm, and I'm assuming the same logic does apply to other protected grounds as well. But there is there anything different in terms of how we should treat misogyny or is it the same in, as other protected grounds? Uh, yeah, actually, um, no, you, how, we can't as a differentiate when it comes to uh, free speech and accountability. It, it can't, you know, you can't, you can't differentiate. Uh, that, that, is, that is one thing I want to say. Uh, to answer another question, which uh, earlier, I think, uh, was, I thought it was Mariana's thing, so I didn't uh, intervene, is that uh, uh, under 509 of the penal code, uh, when we've had this uh, aspect that if it is abusive uh, to a woman in any form, uh, it says... Um, Intending to it, of course, it's, it uses a very archaic kind of an um, expression about insulting the modesty of a woman, but it talks about utters any word, makes any sound or gesture or exhibits any object. And if you can, and this has been expanded to uh, look at, uh, to addressing online misogyny. So that section we have in the punishment and fine has been increased. Uh, so uh, coming back to your question, Divya, that you asked, um, uh, that was meant to me, is that no, you, ca you cannot, you, we cannot differentiate uh, between uh, misogyny and other things, responsibility will, will apply to everyone equally. Uh, and of course, the responsibility has to be viewed within the confines of the law. If I'm hypersensitive or uh, overprotective about uh, uh, things that I assume, and then for that, I need some kind of censorship, I think that is something that cannot be, uh, that cannot be uh, enforced. Uh, the restriction is reasonable, and it has to have some kind of, and, it, and it has some, there are some protocols prescribed un, under Article 19, and it has to meet those tests. And as long as it meets those tests, then I think uh, some kind of curtailment is always held to be constitutional, even by the Supreme Court. Right. Thank you. Um, okay, so another question uh, was in terms of, um, uh, as an educator, like how do we spread awareness about misogyny on social media or digital face spaces, particularly since they, these are considered as spaces of entertainment and leisure. Um, and another person also asked whether there are any examples of advocacy that's been done for curriculum reform um, on, on these issues, uh, which people can share. Um, so, I mean, Amber or Asha, do you have any remarks on this? And please feel free also to answer any of the previous questions if you have anything specific that you'd like to say. No, I just, I, I replied actually to that, um, um, entertainment thing i i don't know if that, nothing nothing is okay uh, none of us are available for anybody's entertainment uh, it's not about taking anything personally we all know the kind of memes um, yeah, that are that are going around and it is just um, unacceptable and uh, i think that just needs to stop so i i i i, I can't say anything more uh, about that none of us are available for anybody's casual entertainment there are also some other questions um uh, divya like how can we stop this how can we make this and these are really very big uh, questions and I, for one, sure uh, do not have, have the answers. How will we uh, stop ma making people use uh, abusive words uh, for women in songs and other things? I think uh, for sure it, it, it really starts from working with self, working with our own communities, 
having these uncomfortable conversations within our own um, uh, families to start with and putting an uh, uh, putting it uh, putting it to an end right there and not waiting for uh, the other person to having to raise that uh, issue again that's the only thing i can uh, think of but yes uh, some uh, uh, really very broad questions and i i think that's also not within the scope of this particular discussion so those are my only two uh, closing uh, remarks for now Thanks. Okay, thank you. I mean, thanks for pointing that out, Asha. I think actually there are a couple of questions uh, in terms of satire and what are the limits of satire because uh, misogyny is so normalized uh, in everyday life that um, the excuse that's usually taken is that it's just humor or satire. So the question is where do we draw the line to say that this is when it's not protected anymore um, and it's not satire. Uh, Amber, would, would you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I think in terms of, uh, you know, the space being casual or, or different ways in which, you know, different kinds of peoples and demographics would approach that space. I mean, I would just say that in that case, we, we need to look at it in the same way that we think of physical space, right? If it's not okay to make certain kinds of remarks, if it is objectionable, so I think in a lot of casual settings, for instance, youngsters do use uh, casteist slurs or, or certain kinds of slangs, and, and that I think we uni largely universally agree that it is wrong. So I don't think uh, there is any other way that we need to think of online spaces in that sense. There is, uh, I mean, I think there is speech which is harmful with very clearly, and that must be seen as that way only. The I think the the other question about uh, uh, I think the earlier question that uh, Divya you had posed about uh, you know best practices that we can look at. Uh, I think we are still kind of grappling with uh, with this idea. I think a lot of community guidelines from platforms also that we see largely. You know there is some some kind of uh, allegiance that that uh, social media platforms say that you know their their practices are in line with let's say global human rights practices, whatever that may mean. Uh, but I think what uh, some of the these challenges of traditional modes of regulating speech that we are facing now. I think largely in terms of any kind of proof of concept or any successes that we might see, I don't, at least I'm not aware of, of something of that nature because I don't think it's been really tried in too many places. One of the things that I will add to, I think what Aparna was saying in her presentation, and she spoke about law enforcement specifically and how dealing with law enforcement is, is essentially a, a scary experience. I do think that there, there is an opportunity for uh, looking at a more proactive role that platforms can play, right? So uh, harmful speech is also, it comes in different kinds of gradations. Offenses uh, or offensive speech also comes in different kinds of gradations. And if you're looking at the impact of that speech also, it is possible for the platform to play a more reflexive or more responsive role and have uh, and then regulate that speech, right? So if you get a certain number of strikes, uh, one of the things that I mentioned briefly in my paper is it's possible, you know, if there is repeated behavior of a certain kind, there is, uh, you could look at some forms of regulation where you introduce some friction, which actually slows down uh, concerted attacks, for instance, or uh, somebody has to go through a PSA announcement before they can post something if, if they seem to be offending along uh, similar lines. So I do think that there is, there is a proactive role that platforms can play. And I do record, I think the point that Aparna made about, you know, what sort of regulatory response do you have for what kind of speech that, that will continue to be a complicated question for us. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, and I just wanted to flag another question also on whether there's available data on how cases of online harassment has been addressed by government bodies and uh, where is such data collected and available. Um, I'm not sure which of you want to answer this question, but anybody? Sorry, go. Sorry, Yes. You know, we can look at data on uh, Section 509 on the NCRB because that data will give us one, uh, you know, one that's an official data published. 
And uh, one of the recommendations in my paper is that they should actually now have a chapter on online abuse and not just misogyny. You categorize in, in various aspects and then that, that will be one uh, very important data that can be generated by, uh, by the government of India. You know, when, when you look at crimes in India, and this is also a crime, that, that's, that's, uh, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, and um, all, since the, we are, I'm engaged a little with the cybercrime portal, they do have data because uh, if you look at the uh, the whole structure of cybercrime portal, NCRB is a key you know key participant you know key stakeholder in the management of the portal. Uh, so that is meant to generate data as well as hashes. You know when they because I mean that was a whole idea that there'll be a kind of a repository of hashes of all these kind of uh, material that is generated. Uh, so an attempt is being made, but it will be actually very good if we, we can compile best practices globally about data and then give it to NCRB because you know that uh, the portal is in a very nascent stage and is evolving. And so when something is evolving, I think they'll be also open to suggestions. It will, it will be important if we can uh, do some kind of advocacy to have kind of a data management uh, with, with that, you know, and, uh, and it's critical. If, you know the, if we know the numbers we are dealing with, it will be easy to structure our responses to it. Uh, so this is my uh, little bit on it, but I'm sure other people working in the sector more than me will be able to uh, give a bet, uh, better answer for this. Uh, Asha, I think you had wanted to say something. No, I was just, I actually texted on the chat saying that I think Amnesty had done a report or a compilation of this kind of cases and released a report, I think, uh, uh, on the kind of abuses uh, faced by women in India, especially I think it was focused on Twitter. I'm not really sure, but there is something around there and so i i wrote to uh, the on the chat saying that if i find it i'll surely share it uh, around but i know that there was something that was done earlier last year yeah okay thanks very much um Um, just, I think, because uh, the short time that all the panelists had in terms of in to make their remarks, um, I was thinking maybe, uh, you know, given that the, the questions that you would have seen in the chat box and also other people's interventions, uh, could uh, I would like to just go back to all of you uh, to see whether you have uh, any closing remarks uh, for just uh, uh, one or two minutes. Um, maybe, Asha, would you like to go first? Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Divya, and uh, all my other co-panelists, and also everyone who attended and participated in this webinar. It's really, I think, as everyone has said, a very important, relevant um, yeah, topic that needed this uh, discussion, and also for the other, the set of other um, sessions in this webinar series. I don't know. I think like. Um, it's okay to uh, it's okay to just sit back when you don't know what's going on, but when you know that something is going on and when you've heard and when you've seen, I think everyone of us should uh, those who are here need to take a stand and stand up for it. So also looking at many of the questions, how do we stop this and how do we end this and how so there's this there's this desperation that this normalizing has happened and it's going on for so long. What shall we do? What can we do? So I really think that if when uh, all of us really believe that this has to end and this will end with me and myself and I think that definitely there, there can be a change and we'll not be like just living in this thing that oh this has been going on forever and it's just getting into different ways. I think we make that commitment this evening to put an end to it as we see it where, where we uh, see it and also a kind of stand up for uh, yeah, stand up for each other. There are so many of us who lack the resources to handle these kind of um, attacks. Uh, it, what it means, what it takes to reach out, and I think those things are also really, really important to uh, stand with um, uh, one another through these kind of uh, crises, so that you know we can get over it and uh, be more um, uh, energized and do, not alone in this uh, fight for justice. So I really, I really feel. Um, that those who have uh, listened to this uh, uh, the session this evening, at least if you could go back and say that, yes, this is what I can do, one, two, three things. Uh, I think that would be a really big uh, takeaway for me uh, from this evening. But I really want to thank you all for listening to me and uh, be engaging with me. And um, I really hope that uh, this has brought some meaning uh, for you all this evening. Thanks. 
Thanks so much, Asha. Uh, Ambar? Uh, thanks. I'll keep it short. I mean, I think the the one thing that it is important to recognize is that the nature of policy problem that we are discussing here is is a very complex one. I don't think there are any easy answers to this problem. And as we go along, I think we need to also evaluate and question uh, our own sort of recommendations and prescriptions. Uh, but I I think, like I said in my presentation, the one thing that we need to do is to center. Uh, the role that power and privilege plays uh, in this conversation. I think the, the oftentimes uh, that is what is missing in, in, in terms of this conversation when we, I think the, the term used about free speech fundamentalism, I think that is the perspective that is often missing, that we don't recognize uh, the, the sort of uh, very blatant inequity that exists uh, and the kind of real life harms that it leads to. And both uh, in terms of looking at, at at what censorship entails here, and then in terms of the the censorship that, that the regulatory responses that we are discussing will also have, we should center uh, that in our discussions and the the real uh, real life impact of these decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Amber uh, Aparna. Um, uh, thank you so much, Divya. While echoing uh, what Asha and Amber have said, and also what Mariana said earlier, I, I want to say I want to reiterate what I said. Uh, I said in my intervention that uh, uh, don't be complacent. Uh, raise the voice. Use whatever avenue that's available to you to complain. Uh, and uh, if online space is anonymous for a misogynist, it's also anonymous for you as a complainant. So that space is available. And we need we need to make sure that the, we complain as much as possible. You know, one talks of data. There is even the data will be shocking because there's so few complaints made because many of us just tend to ignore. If you get an offensive video, we tend to ignore. I think uh, that's that is something I would like to say that if you see, get an offensive video, don't see it, get disgusted, and stop there. You no, know, move on, make a complaint, and see what action that can be shared with people that you should you know that we need to complain about this. Shame the person forwarding uh, those kind of messages, and that is uh, and uh, engaging with uh, parents. Engaging with young adults, young, engaging with uh, children, engaging with people, because everyone accesses internet today. Uh, that's very important. I hope uh, the advocacy never stops, the discussion never stops, the dialogue never stops, because internet is evolving, technology is evolving, and the, our intervention should also evolve, uh, at least, if not com completely commensurate to the way technology is evolving, but at least get somewhere there. You know, let, let, we need to get there. And that can happen only if we are constantly doing it. I thank uh, everyone from IT for, uh, IT for Change for this uh, opportunity. Devia, so much. Thanks so much for uh, being such a great moderator and all, to the, uh, all the co panelists. I hope to see you in some other space soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. So, thank you all. This was um, really inspiring. Um, I think what I'd like to stress is that. Yes, this is a very complex conversation and I don't think there's a silver bullet. I don't think we'll have one solution for all the problems which are being delineated here. And then I'd like to stress that I do think that law has a role. Uh, it's not going to solve everything. Um, but uh, in um, so far as it recognizes some of the problems, it also conveys messages and it encourages uh, people to complain, as Aparna was saying. So uh, I know it's not going to solve um, the issues that we're speaking of here, but it is very important that these issues are recognized uh, by the law as well. And I think we should be discussing this. So uh, congratulations for IT for Change for conducting this, these discussions on this issue as well. Thank you. And I'd uh, really like to thank all the panelists for your really thought provoking and insightful remarks throughout this conversation. It's definitely helped me understand the issue more and I hope it's the same for our audience as well. I think what's really come out is that, I mean, given the complexity of the issue and the fact that I think it's also quite new in terms of what we're dealing with, we need a lot more engagement on this topic um, and particularly on some of the issues that were raised today in terms of uh, legal reform and the framework that we need to 
address it as well as platform responsibility. Um, and I think the future webinars in this series will hopefully be going more in depth into some of those issues. So I really look forward to that as well. Um, I'd just like to hand off to Anita if you have any concluding remarks. Uh, nothing really to add. I think we've ended right on time. Thank you so much, and I invite all the panelists to also engage in this conversation with the uh, speakers who are due to speak in the next round. So that would be 17th and then the 24th. So thank you all, and we will catch you soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Bye. So much. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining Bye. us today. Thank you so much.